it's important to know what is normal for the people that are around you and that you don't try to push people who may have certain, like I said, predispositions, just a certain way that they work into what you consider to be a normal range or a normal scale or what your normal experience is because that person is not having the same experience that you do. It's dark as obsidian And it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun The salt of the earth Fire burning and water dripping How could be using goddess of magic? She is timeless The pillar of the desert need a plug She is the wildest woman and let me say it again for those who need to hear it. The black woman is God. Let me say it again. The black woman is God. woman and welcome back to my spot room 303 if you are new welcome to the crew but my returnees you know what we do if you like this video well then like this video let the comments reveal how you really feel and if you're feeling a vibe we'll go ahead on and subscribe but before you blink share this link welcome wi-fi's welcome back to a very vulnerable episode of the wireless woman today i will talk about my journey with generalized anxiety disorder so you already know just what time it is it is time to call the roll so i need all of my anxious bunnies to the front of the class. It is time to read aloud. Um. Alright, I'm rocking my killer mic wear today. It is my greatest aspiration. To be a female killer mic, make sure you get you some gear, support the cause, vive la revolution. Today's content is going to be a little bit different, as you can see with my setup here. And I had to move like everything around because I'm left handed, so like I can't stand on the left side of the board and still right, so, so everything must go. So in today's episode, I am going to be talking about my journey with generalized anxiety disorder. And it is something that I have had to embrace as just being a part of my personality. All right, full disclaimer, as I've stated, this is my experience my journey with generalized anxiety disorder. This is not intended to take the place of medical advice. It is not being offered as some sort of medical consultation for mental health. However, hopefully my experiences can help build awareness around this particular condition. Now, I felt compelled to really come and talk about my experiences after the unfortunate and untimely death of Chelsea Crisp, God rest her soul, 
and I noticed some similarities that made me feel like my unique perspective would be welcomed at this time. This story seems really unrelated, but I promise it's totally related to what I'm about to talk about. When my son was about seven years old, he went into the doctor for a routine physical. During my son's regular annual physical, his doctor was listening to his heart and she said, you know, something just doesn't quite sound right. And you know, I'm a mom, so I'm like, what's, what's going on? What's the problem? And she said, I don't know, but something just doesn't sound quite right. She said, he's healthy, he sounds fine, but I want to refer him to a cardiologist. So my son goes to the cardiologist and they run the echocardiogram and find out he has what they call a right bundle blockage. It's like an electrical dark spot in his heart. So whenever his heart beats, it sends electrical impulses around the heart and instead of completing a full circle and going back around, it'll get to a certain point and head back the other way. So when I talked to the doctor about it, I was like, you know, can he play sports? Is he going to die? And the doctor said, oh, no, no, no. He said, there's absolutely nothing wrong with his heart. It just formed in a certain way that causes his heart to register the electrical signal differently than other people's would. But he said, this is normal for him. He said, he should be able to do everything everyone else does. We're going to check him out every two years but this is his normal so for me living with generalized anxiety is that it's just my normal however abnormal it may seem to other people it's my normal it's a part of my personality a big part of learning how to live victoriously with the condition was embracing and integrating it into my normal regular life you know so it didn't have to be an imposition on me now especially in my intimate interpersonal relationships it is something that people should be aware of so i'm being very open and very vulnerable by sharing this with you random strangers but it really isn't an attempt to bring a much greater awareness to what generalized anxiety is and what it means to people like me not everybody who has gad will experience it the same way but this is how i experience it and i think that's worth knowing and noting so first i want to start off with how gad or generalized anxiety disorder developed in me and my psyche just like mostly all mental disorders it started in my childhood i was a child of domestic violence my mother met my stepfather around the time that I was about two, three years old. And he, he was a very violent man. And so my mom stayed in an abusive partnership with my stepfather for about 13 years until his natural death. That ain't for me though. That, that's not me. I don't have that spirit in me. I got the spirit of Harriet Tubman and Miss Sophia mixed all into one. I love Hoppo. God knows I do, but I kill him dead for I let him beat me. They would fight often. He beat and hospitalized her several times. So from about seven, eight, nine, when I became aware that this was the situation in my home, I was kind of living in like a terroristic state. So children of domestic violence feel like that violence is their fault. And a lot of times they become protectors or caretakers of their vulnerable parent. You spend a lot of time, as David from Ready to Love would say, trying to get in front of the enemy and really trying to control certain elements of life that you can control, like keeping the house clean, keeping the house quiet, you know, um, not inviting friends over, things like that that you know create chaos in the environment in the hopes of quelling domestic disturbances so you know from a very young child i was hyper vigilant a lot of times um abusive episodes would occur at night would interrupt me out of my sleep i've always all my life been a very light sleeper so for me that constant uneasy feeling that something 
could go bad or happen or go wrong at any moment was kind of like my normal. So for me, it's kind of like that tingly feeling in your jaw when you suck something sour. That feeling was just kind of always around. And one of the worst things, I actually talk about this in my book, God Face. The main character talks about how whenever it's quiet, that means that there's something bad about to happen. You know, it's just like having toddlers or little kids. If it's quiet, check it out because something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Something bad is wrong if you got quiet toddlers. You know what I mean? So it's much that way in a home with domestic violence. So as I got older, I did not know that I had anxiety. But GAD, generalized anxiety disorder, what I would be diagnosed with at about 28 years old, it can manifest itself in many different ways. They give you a GAD diagnosis when your anxiety is kind of a broad thing. So anxiety first showed up for me in high school as social anxiety. I had very high social anxiety. I was very socially awkward. I would say the wrong things at the wrong time. I wanted to be accepted by people and have friends. I knew there was something different about me, but I just felt like if I could be useful or impressive in certain ways, then I could be accepted in the beloved. So um, I had a hard time with large crowds. I always wanted to go to like basketball games or football games, but I couldn't sit in the crowd with other people. It felt like this on the inside. Didn't look like that on the outside, but it felt like this on the inside. So I joined the cheerleading squad. Now, a lot of people don't think that you can have anxiety and be in a situation like that. I've heard them criticize Summer Walker for the same thing. Like, how are you performing for people and you got social anxiety? But there's a barrier between you and other people. By cheerleading, I could sit with a group of girls that I knew, sit in the same spot every time. The crowd wouldn't be able to touch me or sit amongst us. You know, you walk in in a line. It creates a lot of control within a very chaotic environment. So I thrive in social settings like that, where I'm with the same group of people in a designated area. Like you go to the club, but you're in VIP. It's like that. If it's a situation like that, I can handle it, I can go. And the social anxiety aspect of my GAD has resolved a lot. Just as I've grown and matured as a person and been able to realize how irrational my fear of other people that I don't know being in my vicinity is, through therapy, it's much, much easier for me to accept that now. So what anxiety actually is, if I could describe it, it's kind of like this. You are in a room with a bear all the time. That bear follows you to work. That bear lives in the corner of your bedroom and no one else can see it but you. Most of the time, you and the bear are cool. You know, you learn to live with the bear. You know the bear could kill you, but it just generally doesn't. So you're like, mm, me and the bear are cool. And other people are around you like, there's no such thing as the bear. Like, I don't know why the bear, but you know <laughs> how real the bear is. You know that it's there. You know that it can attack you at any time. And sometimes it just does. And no one else can see what has made you anxious. No one else can see what set you off. But you know, and people who are in your life in close proximity or intimate partnership with you should be aware of that and aware of how to bring your anxiety down. Because, okay, mental health is a spectrum like this. And here's a normal range that everybody else is living in, what you just call a normal range. Now, if you are walking on a path in the woods and you see a snake, boom, you go into the realm of <laughs> anxiety. The snake might bite you, it might not. Even if it does bite you, you might live, you might die. We don't know. So once your anxiety has subsided, once the snake is gone, you'll naturally recover into a normal homeostasis. Like, hey, I wonder what I'm gonna eat for dinner. Man, I forgot I was supposed to go pay that bill. Snap. Man, I wonder what's on TV today. Oh, snap, the new season of Ozark is out. 
I'm going to be doing that all weekend, right? This is just your normal range of operations. You don't have any vigilance there. You're not worried that somebody's going to break into your house and kill you. You're not worried that you're going to wake up and your mom's going to be in a pool of blood. Just stuff like that. You don't have to. That doesn't exist in the normal realm of psyche. Now, sometimes you have a financial crisis, a parent dies, and you plunge into depression. Now, this is just a side note that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But bipolar people, this is considered a manic state. For them, this is what you would call the manic state. And then the depressive. Manic depressive is the old term for bipolar. And these people can swing between these two without ever reaching any type of homeostasis. Now, this whole process can create a whole lot of exhaustion and emotional instability for people who have different mental disorders. And, of course, there's going to be a high level of irritability in a person who's not able to manage that. Sometimes we think that irritability is the disease or the disorder, but it's not. It's the residual effect of it. So I dealt with lots of social anxiety all throughout high school and college. Then I got married. Still didn't know that I had generalized anxiety disorder. I just have a hard time dealing with very sudden changes that raises a lot of anxiety for me or being in environments where I can't control the outcome. People think like I'm a controlling person. It's not that. I'm just trying to calculate risks as I go along in a process. And that's important for me to be able to anticipate risk because like I said, I'm always managing this bear that's in the corner, you know, and if the bear get me, I'm going to get you. Um, anyway, <laughs> so then I got married and I was married to a person that had a certain amount of unhealed trauma and PTSD themselves that can create kind of a toxic cocktail of emotional management and if both people don't know I mean you can see how that went so I first went into therapy during my first separation and divorce so when I went through my first separation I began to develop panic attacks didn't know what it was went to the doctor told her I was having a heart attack they did an EKG Come to find out I wasn't dying even though I was sure I was dying. Then they thought it was like angina or like heartburn. But once it became more chronic, my doctor was like, hey, you're having panic attacks. I was like, no way I'm having panic attacks. What could I possibly be panicked about? You know, I've always lived all day and all night in this area right here. Always. You can hear it in how I talk. I've always lived there all day, all night. So I couldn't imagine what could be creating a panic in me. Yeah, like I said, I'm always in front of the enemy. So it was a weird, debilitating situation. Like when my panic attacks would hit, I'm done. So my panic attacks would feel like I was underwater, like an elephant was sitting on my chest. Sometimes the pain and tightness in my chest would squeeze so tight it would bring tears to my eyes. And it was painful, it was scary. Um, and I started having these particularly when I was at work at night. At that time I was working in the county jail and I would have to be around inmates having full scale panic attacks. So I went to a therapist, I went to a counselor at that point because I was like, something's got to give. And that's when I first got diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. Through talk therapy, I was able to develop a lot of management skills, coping mechanisms that helped to alleviate a lot of the panic attacks and gave me the skills that I needed to deal with those panic attacks and to educate other people around me about what my condition required. So I continued on in therapy for about three years and a lot of my anxiety symptoms subsided. You know, I was living like, hmm, on a scale of one to crazy. 
I was living at about a six, you know, functioning normally. But I actually like my anxiety. It makes me high functioning. It was a thing that helped me to get through college and be able to just do a lot of things. I had two children under the age of two at one time. So my anxiety really multiplies me. It allows me to be able to get a whole lot of stuff done, be a really great multitasker, and still be able to pay a lot of attention to very delicate details. So my anxiety is kind of like my superpower. Like, I know Kanye West says that about bipolar disorder, but... <laughs> But, um, so I actually like it. They tried to put me on antidepressants several times and remind me to come back to that, to antidepressants. I'm going to write it up here. Um, so I don't forget antidepressants. I feel like I spelled this wrong. If I did, don't judge me. Depressants. I did. See, that's that perfectionism. And honestly, I call my anxiety black superwoman syndrome, BSS. <laughs> because I think a pressure to perform also played a large part in me continuing to develop anxiety symptoms. Let me know in the comments if the black superwoman syndrome is content you'd like to see me explore further. Because... Like I said, I think it's a separate thing than just what we consider to be an anxiety disorder. And I'm willing to go into it. So they had been wanting to put me on antidepressants. I tried them for a little while. didn't work. I just stayed in the therapy and tried to figure out how to work it out. Because like I said, I like myself on an 8. Other people might not be able to stand it. But I love it. And that's one of the things that bipolar people struggle with too. And why it's hard to keep them on psychotropic drugs. Because this is that genius area of the brain right there. Like this is where you can just accomplish so much and be so productive. And have a high amount of energy too. So I went through therapy for about three years. Continued on with life. Things got a lot better and easier to manage. And I was living with my dad. And it wasn't really, you know, like gout. Yeah, it didn't flare up on me. Things were good. So then I went into my second marriage. Yeah. So I really try not to give my second ex-husband any glory or any shade on this channel to kind of completely disregard him as a person altogether. So just keep that in mind while I'm kind of going through this experience here. Um, I'm sure he's somewhere watching. And just to get in the biggest thrill of his life that he even exists in my atmosphere, in my world, or in my memories, period. So, let's try to keep this to a minimum. But, I went into my second marriage and about a year in, I got diagnosed with adjustment disorder. And I promise, I thought that therapist made that up. I was like, now y'all just making stuff up. But it's a different type of anxiety. It's an acute anxiety that's brought on by the overwhelming of your coping mechanisms because something in your life has changed really, really quickly. And because I was living in an environment with a narcissist, things changed every day. And there was no way for me to control the outcome because I was being gaslit, manipulated, breadcrumbed, discarded, hoovered, word salad, you know, all the narcissistic terms. And so it was just too much for my anxiety. And maybe on another episode, I'll go a little bit deeper into that particular season and that particular experience. But let me just say that if you go back to my Who is the Wireless Woman episode, I talk about being on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And that was what happened. I was in crisis and because I'm such a high functioning person a lot of people couldn't recognize that in me or what was going on because I was constantly making changes like somebody turning a Rubik's Cube trying to fix problems and put out fires and it was exhausting exhausting panic attacks being checked into a mental hospital it was a lot um, and so 
this is why I always encourage people to go to therapy because you may have predilections, predispositions, maybe not a full-blown personality disorder, but there may be some triggers or some issues there that it might really help you to be aware of so that especially raising children and going into relationships with other people, these are things you just need to know about yourself. So this was another one of those times where they wanted to prescribe me antidepressants. Is there an E in this word? This is going to drive me crazy. Listen, if I spelled this word wrong, I tried. Okay? <laughs> I really tried. So, at this point, I'm going to talk about the effects of antidepressants on anxious people. And like I said, this is not like clinical mental health advice doctor's advice it's it's not a substitute for that or even i i can't even prove to you that what i'm saying is right i'm just telling you what my experience was so <clears throat> let's go back to my nice little diagram i had a red marker and i wanted to be able to make these different colors but um i have children and for everybody who has children they understood that whole story I just told with my blinking eyes. All right, so this is me and my anxiety, right? This is, and you know, I don't know why I keep putting this lowercase i in the middle of anxiety. I think I want to take the i out of anxiety. <laughs> All right, this is normal people living a normal life or what people would consider normal. Because in the words of Miguel, what's normal anyway, you know? I mean, what's normal anyway? What's normal anyway? What's normal anyway? I mean, what's normal anyway? All right, and here's depressed people. I hope my mic is picking this up. These are your clinically depressed people. And clinical depression is so real, okay? Stop trying to make everybody who is depressed a depressive because these people they're not just going through something that will pass and you don't need to treat them like that like oh it'll pass this is a condition that has to be managed every day like weight loss like a diet it has to be managed every day okay so this is me without my antidepressants so what antidepressants are created to do is take people with this type of brain chemistry here and bring them up here, right? So as an anxious person, coffee makes me feel like this. I can drink a whole cup of coffee and go straight to bed. I can sip coffee in bed and be asleep. Energy drinks, anything like that. I'm going to wake up feeling like this. Stimulants overstimulate me and shut my body down. Sugar, all that. Just If you're going to give me a donut, give me a pillow and a blanket too. Okay? The antidepressant works like a stimulant. So when I take an antidepressant, I feel like this. And I can't function like that. My life is set up like this. Antidepressants don't make me feel bad. They just make me feel like a normal person. I, what I assume a normal person feels like. Like, I don't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and I have 18 things on my mind competing for attention. Like, I wake up like, oh my God, I fell asleep on that the other day. I wonder if my kids put the food away like I asked them to. Is the refrigerator open? Why is it cold in here? I bet they left the door open. You know, like, that's how my mind functions. I'm like that when I go to bed. I'm like that when I wake up in the morning. I'm like that at lunchtime. Early in the morning, even in the evening, even at supper time. I'm like that all day. Pizza in the morning, pizza in the evening, pizza at supper time. If it goes well, I'll sleep good at night because I'm tired by the end of the day. But antidepressants made me feel about right here, about like a three or a four. And like I said, I can't function like that. I got like kids, a lot of stuff to do. A lot of times, because I'm an anxious person, 
I'll do a lot in order to slow my mind down. Like I might have, and you'll see this with ADHD people. A lot of times people try to slow them down to a normal range like this, but if you actually gave them more to do, you would find them focusing a lot closer. But ADHD is a little bit different than regular anxiety because it doesn't have all of the emotional, psychological components to it. It's just people that, you know, and, and like I said, I don't pretend to know what this is either because I haven't experienced that. A lot of people think because I'm all over the place that I am ADHD, but I'm not. Like, I'm, I'm spinning all these plates, but I can tell you exactly where each plate is and what's on it, how long it's been spinning. Like, that never... It's not a compulsion for me. I'm, that's, that's just how my mind works. Like I said, it's normal for me. The reason why I wanted to do this episode, like I said, is because I looked at people like Robin Williams, the comedian, and Chelsea Crisp. And they were people that had so much potential, so much high energy, that it was hard, just far-fetched for anybody around them to believe that these people could have problems or be depressed and a lot of times because i function at such a high level with my anxiety like this i end up being the strong friend i end up being the person that everybody calls when they need something done because if you add something to my plate it balances me out as opposed to throwing me off like other people you know they're like i can't handle how this me i'm like okay give me 10 minutes you know like that and as I've gotten older and learned how to manage my anxiety, I've become more like, instead of like an 8 or 9 all the time, I'm like a 6 or 7 now. And it actually, people that are on my social media, they know I complain all the time about being so low energy. Because all it takes is a 5 for me to feel like my day is the worst. But I'll still be functioning and getting stuff done. But what people don't understand is that I'm actually depressed. Like for me... It would be this for them. But because anxious people, and I hear this a lot from people that have anxiety, can still function in their depression, people don't think it's so bad. But from my 8 to a 5 is the same as somebody else's 5 to a 2. You see what I'm saying? So, when you see people like that and something happens, like they unallowed themselves or something like that is such a huge shock to people because people will say well i didn't think it was that bad so it's important to know what is normal for the people that are around you and that you don't try to push people who may have certain like i said predispositions just a certain way that they work into what you consider to be a normal range or a normal scale or what your normal experience is because that person is not <laughs> having the same experience that you do like i can literally be on what somebody else's one or a two is and still be a five or a six and i go through anxiety episodes because see gad generalized anxiety disorder can transform into any other type of anxiety disorder so i'll give you an example as i've aged and certain characteristics about my life have changed my anxiety management style has to change along with it like i said i don't want to take the antidepressants because antidepressants make me depressed <laughs> they just don't work for me so, as I've gotten older, my body has gotten tired of functioning at that level, which can create some cognitive decreases. It kind of creates a little bit of relief in my anxiety, but then it creates more anxiety because I'm like, what's wrong with me? Why am I not me? You know, but I'm learning through therapy how to integrate and accept the things that I cannot change, serenity to know the difference. So I was working from home for like the last year and I love working from home, you know, working from home is great. So about a week ago, about a week ago, a week ago, about a week ago, a week ago, everything was good about a week ago. Huh, it was all good just a week ago. I had an episode. 
and I've never experienced anything like that. And it was, I had like some really irrational fear. Like it felt like fear was being pumped into my veins. It was like an adrenaline response to something that I, I don't know. I could hear footsteps. Like, I know what you're thinking. You're losing your mind. Probably. But let me explain what happened. So I was crying uncontrollably. Like, I couldn't stop it. And I was praying about it. I was like, listen, guy, you're going to have to get me through today. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. I just need you to get me through today. And then I started having a panic attack. But this was a panic attack that went on and on and on like the song that never ends and i had somewhere to go you know like i said other people's two it's still my five i was like eh, get up off the floor you know it took a couple tries like i was being chased in a horror film but eventually i got up off the floor i left the house but when i got ready to get in my car and leave my house i felt how i felt in my first panic attacks and it was like waves and and i felt like this and I hadn't felt that in a long time and I actually had to do some research and what I was experiencing like the dread of having to leave the house because like I said I've been working from home and then going back into the work environment where there's a lot of factors that I can't control I was starting to experience agoraphobia like agoraphobia symptoms are kind of like a heightened anxiety and it's the place where your condition can turn into a long-term disorder so for me making those changes in my environment and forcing myself to accept change helps me to continue to adapt and manage my anxiety because like if i had stayed in the house like another year and we have to be sensitive because a lot of people are experiencing this type of form of anxiety and like I said it's been very fun and comfortable to work from home but as you integrate back into the real world the real world can become a very scary place and I predict that we are going to see a big spike in anxiety and anxiety related conditions with people as things in the world change you know so I Went back to my doctor and my therapist with these new symptoms and worked out a care and management plan. So it's like I said, I don't know if some of these other people had that type of support system, showed that type of vulnerability to, you know, their doctors or people that were around them in order to create a safety net. But I wanted to come on and share my particular journey and experience with anxiety and like I said the journey continues you know I don't know what comes next on this journey because the agoraphobia came out of nowhere and generalized anxiety disorder can show up any kind of way it just depends on what my life experiences are and so everyone has some level of anxiety whether it shows up when you have to give a speech in front of your colleagues or if you're an actor you feel that kind of nerves or if you're an athlete before you go out and play a game you kind of feel that pump up of the nerves and you know that's just anxiety that's all it is and so mine can be induced by nothing or irrational things and that's just my normal you know like i said sometimes it turns on and i accomplish great feats like writing books and doing plays and you know it, it keeps the feelings very close to the surface for me and like I said that can be good or bad but I'm hoping that by sharing you know my experiences it will help you to be sensitive to other people who may be suffering with this they may not even know you know you might be the person that can urge someone who's next to you that you know this has a certain amount of hyper vigilance to say you know you might want to go and see somebody like you might want to go and talk to somebody about you know just your fears and concerns that you have because it seems like you have a lot you know <laughs> you can see how different my energy is just in standing up and doing my presentation this way that's why i sit in my chair a lot because my energy does a lot um if you have questions 
by all means drop them in my comments below while you're down there in those comments go ahead and drop me one of those fire headphones emoji make sure you subscribe to this channel share this link with people that you care about if you would like to see more content developed around this or other subjects especially when it comes to mental health I've, I've had to educate myself a lot in order to make sure that i'm responding to my own traumas and issues the right way so like i said i'm not a doctor but i might be a good resource that could help point you in the direction you should go um so by all means you can email me at admin at the wildestwoman.com i will reply but as always until the next time i am debbie and nikki your neighborhood wireless woman class is now dismissed i will see you in the next episode